uh, watch it, everybody. Um, I am honored to be with you today. Uh, my name is Candice Linklater. I am coming to you from the Algonquin Territory, um, also known as Ottawa, Ontario. Um, I'm Moose Creek First Nation. Um, I was born and raised in Moose Factory, Ontario, on my res. Um, I have experience in education as a teacher um, at the high school level, elementary level. Um, I'm also an early childhood educator, and uh, I also taught at um, adult learning level as well. Um, so I have a huge passion for education. I love to teach. I love to share what I know in, in the best way that I can. Um, I feel it's it's my privilege to share what what I have learned throughout the years as an educator and also as a student. Um, so right now I am uh, currently doing my PhD in education leadership. Um, I have my master's in indigenous education and I did a lot of my um, I so I have my bachelor of education where I received it at Lakehead University. Um, I did a lot of my schooling in the Aurelia area. Um, lived there for many years, so if you're from there, um, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful area to live. Um, aside from that, um, aside from teaching, I, I have experience in policy at the Assembly of First Nations, where I worked in their education sector. Um, aside from that, uh, what I do now, um, this is what I do for a living. I do workshops that discuss uh, decolonizing education, or I do um, Indigenous feminism approaches, um, not just in the in, in education context, but organizationally. Um, I also work with different organizations to help decolonize their practices. I look at their policies, help them develop frameworks. Um, uh, and I also work with the Native Women's Association of Canada, um, where I just started uh, as their social media manager, which is quite different, uh, different scope of work for me. Um, but this came because um, you may have heard of my page called Relentless Indigenous Woman on Facebook. Um, it grew exponentially in the past year. Um, it went from like 3,000 to over half a million followers this year alone. Um, so there's a huge thirst and a hunger out there for you know, indigenous advocacy and our ways of knowing, because as we can clearly see around the world, uh, not just with climate change, but like organizationally, politically, at the level we're at, it's unsustainable under capitalistic and colonialistic ways of doing things. So when we're approaching decolonizing education, um, we're challenging those very systems that are unsustainable for us as humans and um, acknowledging what is the original ways of this land. So I'm very honored to um, provide you with this presentation today on decolonizing education. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I do have a slideshow I'm going to share with you. And I'll... Um, It'd be great, great to get to know you if you want a place where you are before uh, I start presenting um, what you do. Um, are you an educator? Are you interested in education? Uh, do you work in other capacities in education? I'd be very curious to know what you do, um, where you're from. Um, I, I'd love to know um, who you are, if you would like to uh, comment or place it in the chat if you're comfortable and I'll uh, read it when I can. Um, so I'll start the presentation now. All right, so decolonizing education. So uh, Jay, I gave my introduction there. Um, so if you have any questions uh, to me or about me, um, I do have a website called relentlessindigenouswoman.ca, um, but I'll get to that at the end of the presentation. For now, this is what we're going to be uh, discussing today. Um, the legacy of colonization and in education, decolonization and indig indigenization, First Nations lifelong learning model, holistic learning, commitments to decolonization, resurgence, self, classroom, and beyond, resources that I'm going to share with you today that will help guide your decolonization process, and my closing remarks. So today's learning goals, these are the three things that you will hopefully be empowered to do and um, inspired to do. 
So to reflect on the impacts of colonialism and approaches for combating it through decolonial indigenous worldviews, to learn classroom and administrative practices and strategies to integrate holistic learning, and to commit to decolonization and resurgence for indigenous peoples from self, classroom, and beyond. So before I start, I'm gonna go in the chat and just see, have a quick look to see where everyone's from. I'm curious who I'm talking to. All right, so there's someone cool from Dakota, cool. Joshua, working in region one, KB, high school teachers, Ottawa U, that's awesome. I live in Ottawa. Uh, grew up in Aurelia, I live in Barrie. Yeah, Barrie is cool. Okay, right on. Ministry of Education as an education officer in London region. Sweet. And Winnipeg. Oh, I was just in Winnipeg this weekend for uh, Manitou Abbey. It was amazing. Uh, Sturgeon Falls. Ooh, that's far north. I think that's in the north. All right. Okay. Ooh, grade five teacher. I taught grade five for two years. That was fun. Early childhood educator. Oh, I have an ECE in here. That's great. Looking to create land-based education. Sweet. All right. Wonderful. So happy to be here with you all. I, I am honored to um, share what I know. Um, and you may already know um, some of these things or not. All that I'm hoping to do today is inspire you to um, you know, consider these aspects. Um, you don't have to take everything, but I will have this forwarded. Um, I'll forward this presentation to Alicia um, just to see if there's anything you want to go back on and reflect on a little more. Um, I do have resource, um, references. So if you want to read more on these topics, you'll see on each slide in the corner where that information came from. So I really try to have my presentations be um, as substantiated as possible and researched. All right, so the legacy of colonization and education. So there's this term called cognitive imperialism. And this I believe was coined by the wonderful Marie Batiste. I really recommend that you read some of her things. She is, I would say, one of the first people to really discuss decolonizing um, education. So in education, English is the dominant instruction that erodes diversity of cultures, languages, and knowledge. It assumes superiority of knowledge and people in a hegem hegem How come I can never say this word? Hegem and somebody help me out. Hegemonic. Anyways, for all this, the like hegemony. Hegemony. Hegemonic. 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 Hegemonic, thank you. I always have a hard time. Like I know what it means. <laughs> Hegemo hegemonic, gosh. Okay, so sorry for my pronunciation. I may be smart, but like I have a hard time <laughs> pronouncing this word. <laughs> um, so basically placing us um, is the same in uh, education. So other depicted as uh, cultural manifestation and maladjust maladjustment, not normative centers. So basically anything that is, um, you know, Eurocentric, um, influenced, um, anything outside of that scope is seen as other um, or, you know, uh, an elective as many colleges or um, other programs may or school organizations may do. Um, all right. So Cognitive imperialism in education. So lack of diversity in the cat in the academy is projected as a deficiency of the other um, of cultural understanding. So how does it manifest? It defines success as assimilation to dominant values and norms um, and languages. So it sees success as long as you look like this, you can talk like this and write like this. This defines success. So we really have to let's try to challenge that. What is success? What does that person look like? If you were to create a profile of success for a student, what are those components? And ask yourself, why are those components important? 
in the current um, or the standard um, type of profile that you would get from the current way of that we do things here in Canada and Ontario, um, it, it really promotes more so uh, an able-bodied, um, you know, certain type of um, outside context that would enable somebody to be successful it has to take into consideration context um, and nurture nurturing those pieces. And I'll get to that eventually. Um, so it manifests in contradictory identities and ambivalent self-concept. So their uh, self-identity could be very much um, debilitated because they don't fit that profile that the education tells us that we should look like, sound like, and be like, dress like even. So no conventional form or place where Indigenous knowledge has been allowed to thrive. So Indigenous educators are projected as experts on all matters Indigenous. So there's a lot of, um, you know, we have to basically question what the convention is, question what the standards are. If you were to create a profile of what the system is currently telling us what to do, how do those values align or compare to the values uh, specifically on decolonization and indigenization, which I'll get to in a second. And also, um, of course, the, the, the current system um, was built on white supremacy embedded in the curriculum. So young students are taught implicitly and explicitly through curriculum and what have you, um, and you know, media, that white people are the only ones with a rich history and therefore superior, normalizing oppression. So black people, the beginning of enslavement, indigenous peoples, the beginning of discovery. So real, like, it's always as if, you know, the center focus of what we learn about with history, it's always centering. It's really like, look at the curriculum and, and, and if you're changing it right now, that's amazing. But question, like, who is it centering and why do we discuss natives in the context of discovery or in the context of, um, you know, um, their involvement with settlers as if it was always peaceful. Why was there, why was there uh, contradict, um, not contradiction, conflict? Um, and and I will get the, to that in a moment. Um, talks a lot about treaty in that regard. So discussing treaty would really address a lot of those issues. Um, indigenous knowledge is treated as a, as a product of tribal politics and identity. So a byproduct of culture, while Western knowledge is treated as a depoliticized context. So it's as if adding anything indigenous is like, oh, that's nice. It, it will add a little bit of indigenous here and there just to make us feel like we're including them. But how can we actually center the the you know indigenous knowledge and ways of being in how can we embed it into the system itself without just adding you know a couple of things here and there to make us feel better so there would be a difference between you know diversity and, and inclusion is a huge buzzword as well um and it's uh it's it again others people of color so diversity diversity to what what is it diversifying from what is the center and inclusion, including into what are, is it for the sake of, you know, assimilating those pieces and then including them in our table. So really look at if you do have a diversity and inclusion system, um, have components or just totally disrupt it completely and question and challenge how can we have anti racism and decolonization in that as opposed to diversity and inclusion, where the standard is, you know, the a white settler in most cases. Um, but and that's what I've seen so far. But I know there's a lot of, you know, discussions that are, you know, what you need to add anti racism and decolonization as well. Um, just give me a sec, I'm gonna look in the chat. Uh, okay, I was just checking to see if there's any questions, but I see that there's some more people introducing themselves, which I love. Oops. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, colonial influences on body and spirit and disengagement. Okay. So embodied learning educators. Um, so I talk a lot about embodiment um, in not only um, my academic practice, but I try, uh, I don't know if you've been to any of my lives on Facebook, but I talk about like embodiment, embodied feminism, embodied sovereignty, um, embodied learning. So embodied learning educators can inherently honor indigenous ways of knowing. They respect the learner's journey by helping them knowing to come back into their bodies to experience their own knowing. So I will expand on this a little if this seems a little vague right now. So the reason why this is so important is because a lot of the philosophers like Plato, Socrates and Descartes um, all asserted that the body was unreliable in perceiving objective truth. So it took the body and the holistic portions of the learning process outside of education. So don't trust the body when, you know, it is uh, feeling a particular way to guide learning or to even be a tool for and with learning. So it just totally disregarded that piece. So when we do talk about, you know, decolonizing education, how do we become or how do we acknowledge our body and honor it as a learner and as a teacher um, or just as a person? How do we honor that process? Um, so again, these dominant Western positivist assertions have positioned the body at an inferior level, closer to animals in the hierarchy of Western intelligence. So again, it, you know, the brain is up here and the body's down here. So when we're learning, it has to be about the brain, according to Western ideology, and not about the body. Um, when we talk about, um, you know, decolonization, um, holism, so considering the body, spirit, mind, and soul, sorry, body, spirit, mind, soul, well, emotions, um, they're all intertwined and we all need to honor each piece in order to effectively impact the, the learning that it won't just stay stagnant in the brain. So I'll get to that in a moment. So decolonization, bleh, decolonization <laughs> and indigenization, that's a tongue twister. So if decolonization is the removal or undoing of colonial elements, then indigenization could be seen as an addition or the redoing of indigenous elements. So indigenization moves beyond tokenism gestures of recognition or inclusion to meaningful change the practice, practices and structures. So it's, it's beyond tokenism. Um, so power dominance and control are rebalanced and returned to indigenous peoples. The indigenous ways of knowing and are perceived, presented and practiced as equal or more to the Western ways of knowing and doing. So if you are an administrator here um, and you want to, you know, have, um, have your place indigenize or decolonize, I would really recommend go to um, uh, an indigenous experts on education and how to, you know, address those, those components. How can we truly honor um, the indigenous ways of knowing and being in education that, you know, re-centers the student and community as the center. And we'll get, a, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in our lifelong learning First Nations education model. So here are like some, some uh, very quick ideas on examples of indigenization in education and could include the inclusion of indigenous readings, adoption of indigenous learning approaches in the classroom. Um, one of my friends who is, um, I'm not sure if she's a knowledge keeper yet, um, but um, she really shared with me, you know, the importance of talking about the sharing circle in my workshop today. Um, so it's the process of providing an opportunity. So how do I say this really quickly? Because I know I have a lot that I would like to share with you uh, this afternoon. Um, but it's having a particular topic at hand. The students are in the middle and we have like a, a talking stick of some sort um, that is used to signify that that is the person that has the floor and they're going to be talking. So. Although that sounds very simplistic, 
what that really does is provides an opportunity for voice and community. It does more than just, you know, we're just talking and sharing. Um, it, it shares, it offers community. And a lot of the questions or topics at hand can be of uh, emotional significance or growth or what they learn throughout the day. But any kind of practice that, you know, honors community, honors self and autonomy is, is indigenization or, or indigenous ways of knowing. Um, and another way, learning on and from the land where possible. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, um, you know, learning on the land and, you know, effective ways of doing so in a moment. Oh, artwork. I was just gonna say a little thing about artwork. So if we want like, um, you know, land-based learning and stuff. I did this art therapy the other weekend um, with my partner and we, um, the facilitator used like natural things to, to, for paint. Like uh, they used uh, beet juice, they used um, leftover um, smudge ash, um, they used uh, cumin, you know, like natural things just, just to add like le less toxicity in, in art projects and just really bring the land in and where possible. Um, so I thought that was really neat. Um, so there's different ways to like add land uh, into art. And that was one of my favorite things to do with my students as well. Uh, we would bring like leaves and stuff and create art pieces with leaves. They love that. <laughs> um, so decolonization and indigenization. So whether or not you work with indigenous students, all educators have the responsibility to understand the ways settler colonialism has historically impacted and continues to shape our current education systems. Decolonization offers a process to resist these forces and instead move toward healing by affirming Indigenous voices, sovereignty, and knowledge systems. So that's that part. Um, I love discussing this model, uh, the First Nations Lifelong Learning Model. This was made back in 2007, and actually one of my friends um, was partaking in this um, um, development. Uh, lots of research, it's research-based. Um, again, there's a link at the bottom once this gets sent out for uh, more information. So for First Nations peoples, our purpose of learning is to honor and protect the earth and ensure the long-term sustainability of life. Quite different from um, you know, the Western Eurocentric capitalistic colonialistic way of doing things. So usually success has to do with, you know, our ability to work and produce money for the purpose of producing more money and using more resources and more, more, more. So whereas this has a responsibility aspect and component to it, it really challenges and could upset a lot of the, the the things that are already instilled in our minds, it can really like what does that look like? Um, can really challenge those pieces. So I wish I could. I, mean, I wish I had this bigger. I don't know if you could see it. Does anybody want me to zoom in to this model just to see the different components? Yes, please zoom in. Yeah. I can any of it <laughs> okay i should have created like i was gonna create like an entire like one slide hold on we'll see if i can zoom in just for a moment can you see what i'm doing yes uh, yep i can see that yep. now yep. okay okay i'm just gonna start over here Okay, so this is online. If you do want to Google it, if you're on a computer right now or even on your phone, um, Google First Nations Lifelong Learning Model if you want to like zoom in on your own. Um, so basically, the student is the tree. And these are the components that nurture said student. So we have um, the spiritual, social, economic, uh, political are the leaves. Who are the nurturers of this? This is you, this is the elders, the teachers, the parents, the mentors, the counselors. It offers nourishment to the tree. And what are the roots? Where do our roots come from as learners? 
comes from um, our nationhood, our clan, our community, our sense of self, family, ancestors, our languages and our traditions and ceremonies. Those are what keep us still. And so, so this, uh, according to the research that was done um, on this model, this is what lifelong learning looks like. And these are the components and pieces that are absolutely essential to ensure, you know, our students are nurtured throughout life. It doesn't just happen at school. It is a collective process and a collective responsibility. Uh, one second, I'm going to check the chat before I go into the next uh, piece. Okay, thank you for sharing the link, Alicia. Yeah, so this is wonderful. There's a lot more information in the report itself because it does discuss, I believe, the Métis lifelong learning and as well as the in Inuit lifelong learning model. So quite similar, but you know they, they offer another perspective as well if you wanna look a little more. Oops, <laughs> oops. All right, anyways. <laughs> so here are some reflective questions. It's based on this lifelong learning model. So how can family and caregivers actively be involved in the learning process that is accessible to them? So I know we talk a lot about, you know, involving parents um, or caregivers into the atmosphere of learning. How can we make it as accessible and not so intimidating to them and for them as possible so that our students can really see and understand that they're not, you know, learning is not just in support, um, not just supported by the teachers, but outside as well. How can their voice and perspective be empowered? So yes, we invite them into our spaces, into our learning spaces, and we want to acknowledge them, but how do we show them that their voice matters as well? Because like with, especially with like First Nations um, communities um, or indigenous communities in Canada, that autonomy and that agency was completely taken um, from residential schools and their process of their horrific process of doing things that took that autonomy away. So there's this real resistance and hesitancy with the education system. And I understand that because although like it's not as brutal as it used to be, a lot of the underlying components are very similar to how the uh, residential school system used to run. Um, so how can their autonomy and their agency be honored in your classroom and in your school? How can community be involved in their nourishment of learning beyond school grounds? What does community need to know outside of school? So when students are out, so like think about your area, where, what school district you're in, are there other partnerships that you could potentially be making um, with and around the community? Because it's not just about school, it is, it, is, it is a community process. When we forget about that piece, we forget about the student. The student is all of this. The student is not just a student in school, they are learning always. So how can we develop community and learning for the student? Um, so what should community know? What tools do they need to also support and nourish our students? Um, so what kind of partnerships perhaps that can be made um, for the sake of, you know, holism? Um, Yes, the presentation will be available afterwards. I'll, I'll forward it to Alicia uh, Cameron, who is the host today. Um, Alicia, I guess you'll disseminate the presentation to the participants. Because um, I know there's a lot of information that I am sharing today that, um, you know, just sit back and uh, reflect on some of these pieces throughout the week or whenever. Yeah, we will take care of that for sure. <laughs> Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so spirit. So there are four components, you know, that um, many Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island discuss. So we have uh, spirit, we have physical aspect, the cognitive intelligence or uh, mental aspect, and then emotional. Although like we don't see them as compartmentalizing, like there's not just one without the other, they're all one, which is why, you know, you see it as a medicine wheel or in a circle. It's, it's all interconnected. It's not separating, but for the purpose of, 
you know, just trying to uh, focus on some of these things, they're all interrelated. So before I go into this more, I'm not saying spirit, this is like the only thing it's going to address. It addresses everything. But these are just some ideas that I'm going to um, discuss on how you can address, um, you know, these, these four components of holism or holistic learning. Whew. All right. So if you're working with Indigenous peoples, and I'm assuming that many of you have or are, I think that's the way that it was advertised uh, for this workshop. Many of us, all of us, I won't say many of us, because all of us, even if you didn't uh, grow up in your Indigenous, edu uh, indigenous community or you don't know, um, we all have intergenerational trauma or impacts within us, uh, whether it's a loss of our language, loss of our culture, loss of our sense of community, it impacts all of us. And a lot of us are on the uh, reclamation journey, which I am personally. And um, it's been, it's been amazing, uh, reclaiming, reclaiming it all back. So in saying that, it is, it is very important to understand and acknowledge that those pieces of our spirit that I've been missing for so long, not just within ourselves, but it carries from ancestor to ancestor. So when we talk about intergenerational healing, it is not just healing us as right now, it heals those pieces of our ancestors that are in the spirit world that they couldn't do, or they were forbidden to do or ashamed to do. So think about those pieces that were taken from residential school. So it's our languages, our spiritual practices. Um, so how can those be nourished and embedded, honored in our in our um, in our classroom, in our community? <clears throat> so there's this um, word called traditional ecological knowledge. So T E K. If you don't want to do like some research on this. Um, for all those fellow nerds out there. Uh, indigenous languages are like ecological encyclopedias and ancestral guides with profound knowledge cultivated over centuries. So English is a really interesting language and I and I I want to learn a little bit more about you know the the nuances that indigenous languages offer in terms of our relationality to from person to person, person to animal per, or person to nature. There, there are things that are embedded in our language that connect us explicitly or implicitly in our language as opposed to English where um, I believe, um, I forget her name, Robin Kimmerer from Braiding Sweetgrass. She discusses how English is very noun, um, heavy a lot of our stuff are nouns so it's very objectifying it is as if like i'm a person you're a person and or i'm a person and this is an object there is no relation between us but within the indigenous many indigenous languages it when we discuss you know a person to a person or a person to a, a tree or an animal the way that it is translated or the way that it is understood in the brain is it's, it's a connection between you and that, that tree or you and that animal. So it's really interesting, um, you know, just the language pieces alone offer that insight or our brain and our spiritual understanding of relationality as opposed to objectification uh, with English. Um, English is a, quite an interesting language. Um, okay, the bottom piece I really wanted to talk about because I was just um, listening to or I listen to my books. I don't know if any of you all uh, like to listen to books. I have a hard time sitting down and reading a physical book. Anyways, I was listening to a book yesterday um, on how um, the act of or the process of having a more robust vocabulary when it comes to our emotions, our ability to regulate our emotions um, is increased. So when um, they did this study and they, they, I think interviewed like 800 people or something. And on average, adults could only like um, identify four main emotions. It was like sad, happy, angry, and I can't remember the other one. Anyways, 
but what the study showed was that the lack of um, vocabulary for emotions decreases your self uh, regulation when it comes to said emotions. So if we're able to address and identify what we are feeling and put a name to it, we're better able to regulate our emotions. So I'd be really curious um, for those that are on the journey of revitalizing Indigenous languages, um, you know, and, and speaking to knowledge keepers and elders about language, it would, I would say it would be very amazing to have, um, you know, emotions, um, learn what those languages are, how to say those emotion in, in, in that Indigenous language for those students. Um, to support emotional and spiritual regulation. So when you're, we're learning, like I know for myself, when I learned my Cree language, like it was more so like objects, um, you know, that those are pants and that's a, that's a moose, that's a goose and whatnot. But it'd be really amazing too, to also incorporate how do we um, amplify or center emotions as well when we're learning about our language I am feeling this um, and then students then are better able to regulate their emotions and I'll talk about you know uh, mindfulness as well in a moment um, so a great resource where I, I found this piece um, and I put it in the resource section as well is from learning the land so learning the land is developing a sense of self in relation to the land. So what is your birth story? Our birth stories often have connection to the land. What are your family traditions? What are you more interested in learning of? Um, how can you and your nation's identity be strengthened? A lot of our identities and our teachings are directly related to the land. So it helps identify a sense of self. Where do I come from? So developing a sense of belonging. How has the land shaped your identity? And if not, how can we support that identity um, development? What seasonal activities do you practice or play? So these are just like, these are not like meant to be prescriptive, but just reflective pieces on how um, directly or indirectly land can influence a student's sense of self or even your sense of self. So you can go through these questions as well. Doesn't matter if you're indigenous or not, we're all from the land. We all go back to the land, all of us. So it'd be really, um, uh, so if you do wanna use this tool, how can the, um, I would encourage you to reflect on these as, as a teacher, as a person yourself, and then try to you know elicit some side of conversation with your students. Um, regarding this. Um, so why am I here? Um, and where am I going? So a lot of these pieces can be directly connected to the land and um, learning the land, um, that site, and um, they're supported by the Treaty Education Alliance as well. So they're really amazing. So I'd, I'd really encourage you to look more into this. Um, I have the link there as well. Um, so land is the first teacher, um, land is our first teacher. And I talk a little bit about how body is our first teacher because body is land as well. We are part of the land. So when we talk about, you know, indigenous peoples protecting land or people advocating for the land, it's literally land protecting itself. We are the land. You are land. We're all related. So, so spirit and blood memory, one second. Ugh. Indigenous elders often say that memory is in the blood and bone, that our, our stories are passed, not just verbally, but through a kind of genetic memory. Um, when I was younger, um, so I was born and raised in my native community, <clears throat> but uh, it was, I was not brought up to love my culture. If anything, I was brought up to be ashamed of it because of colonization and the impacts of residential school really influenced how my family perceived our traditions. 
And I was really um, debilitated in that progress of learning about my ways. I'm sharing that because there are moments when I grew up, I smelled sweet grass for the first time. I think I was like 14 or 15. And it was like this rush of memory in a way, even though I've never really smelt it before. It's like my body could remember what it was. And when I heard the drumming for the first time, it was like my body wanted to move in a certain way. We all have these memories that are embedded in us. So when we hear our, our stories, our tradition, and we hear our songs, there is something that quivers in our soul. So in addition to the psychological and social pathways, there's evidence of epigenetic pathways are involved in the transmission of trauma. So there's trans, um, transmission of trauma as well um, that could be signaled or triggered, especially in an um, education system potentially. So the way that you know discipline can occur or not um, in a classroom, it could trigger particularly indigenous children and particularly indigenous parents because our ancestors had to go through the traumatic experience of residential school. So what are like practices, although not as horrific as they were, there are definitely similarities in the way things are done. Um, in terms, even like in classroom structure, teacher being the center, desks, really challenge even those, those little things that seem normal, like question them. Why is it like that in the first place? How can we center students more than the teacher being the focus of, of learning? Um, so memory of song, dance, ceremony, languages, smells, and medicine. Also remember though, we are not just our trauma. We are our healing and we have our own songs. We have our own practices and ceremonies that strengthen us as well. And this is of significant importance when and where you can um, acknowledge and empower and honor those pieces of us because we're not just our trauma. We are our healing and our empowerment too. And we often can forget that because we know we talk about our trauma a lot. Um, I was gonna do this activity with you, but there is a lot that I wanna cover. Um, <clears throat> but I want you to reflect on this anyway. Um, I hope my internet's not cutting out. Am I, am I choppy right now? Oh, you're good still. Okay. My camera is like being weird. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so learning the language activity. So <clears throat> considering these six areas, think of you, think of yourself. So at what level could you color in each piece? How important or how um, apparent are these pieces in your life? Would you color in one, two, three, four, five rings or none? And if it's, you know, two or less, perhaps, you know, reflect on ways that you can strengthen those pieces, your language um, or offering or enhancing or supporting the reclamation of Indigenous language. Kinship. How and where does kinship fit into play? Sorry, there's a weird noise back. Sorry. Um, transfer of uh, traditional knowledge. How um, often does that occur in your classroom or in your learning setting? The surrounding environment of your classroom. How does it support, um, you know, the centering of the student, creating a safe environment for them? Um, ceremonies and celebrations, how often does that occur or how often does, um, is, is it being honored in, in one way or another? Forms of expression, how and where are students able to express their emotions in a safe manner, even when they're angry? How can they express themselves safely um, in your classroom or learning environment? So those are pieces that you can consider. Um, I was gonna do this activity where you, like, you share and, and whatnot, but because I got cut off there for a moment, um, I don't have much time. 
Um, so I'll, I'll continue. I'll just look at the chat for a second. The teacher should be, yes. Yes, that's a good one. Teacher should be the facilitator, not the center. Children should be engaged and discover what they know and how to find the developer journey. Yes. Ooh. All right, the body. Okay, give me a second. Mm. Okay. Embodied learning. I wish I had a stand up desk. I need to get one. But like, antsy when I'm sitting down too long. <clears throat> Embodied learning refers to the pedagogical approaches that focus on everyone's innate and autonomous competence. So physical, emotional, cognitive to build learning process. So our body is the first educational system we experience. So um, our, how our body feels in response to something, our body is telling us something that is communicating us whether it is safe whether it is good, our body teaches and our and children are great at at, um, at understanding this. <clears throat> Although they may have not have the language, they they I feel like I know they're they're a lot more capable of understanding what's happening in their body. And we're told to ignore it, like as we grow older. But we shouldn't. We should encourage listening to our body. It tells us stuff. It, it communicates things to us. So theories of embodied uh, cog cognition should that <laughs> suggest that the mind is not an abstract and isolated entity. Rather, the mind is integrated into the body sensory motor systems. Um, so as children learn, it is not they're finding a solution to a presented issue. They are living it. So they become literally part of their learning. So as they're like working on puzzles, they're working on um, a scientific project, they're, they're figuring it out, uh, or they're, or they're um, doing imagination play. It is very real to them. They, what, what they are doing with their body is it translates to their mind. Um, so it's important for, you know, teachers as educators to guide and acknowledge that, that process for them. So the voice, um, the voice is a tool for that uh, person using voice as a form of expression and healing can directly impact the intergenerational trauma experienced by indigenous people that have been silenced for decades. So um, if there's an opportunity uh, for um, your students, uh, your indigenous students to use their voice because our voice um, not just with music has been silenced, but our voices as Indigenous peoples have been silenced uh, when we, you know, express a need or we're expressing um, our values. So the moment that we're able to express that in one way or another, it helps heal our intergenerational trauma. And singing. I, I love singing. Um, I actually am um, going to start picking up my guitar again soon. I had my nails, you know, those like fake nails. I had like long nails forever. And I cut them off yesterday because I, my body, my soul needs to sing. Um, I need to express myself. I'm listening to my body. So I'm uh, giving it an opportunity to express itself. Um, some of you may have heard of Chubby Cree. He is an amazing um, singer. I'm going to show you a clip one of my favorite clips of him. Um, there's a lot more videos of him on YouTube as well. One second. So he's gonna do his song, it's called Rocky World. It was made by a person from Alexis uh, First Nation and he handed it down to Noah and Noah's been doing oh so well with that. Thank you. So here you go. Oh, hey, oh, hey, 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 
If you want to hear more, he's amazing. Um, he gives me chills every time. So what you're hearing is not just him singing, like it's a reclamation. It echoes throughout time. It, it is amazing. It's not just a song. It echoes. Our ancestors hear it. It heals. Um, there's something about it because it's spiritual. And not only that, it helps heal. I can't imagine like what his body is feeling too when he sings and, um, you know, speaks in his language, hits those high notes, like it's amazing. It's not just about singing. It is so much more than that. What happens to our body, the healing that occurs. Oops. So dancing. I love dancing. Um, Okay, so for generations, Indigenous peoples have been forbidden to powwow dance. It was literally illegal to uh, gather um, legally until like the 70s, I believe. As we participate in our traditional dancing, it brings the person healing along with their ancestors. Um, dancers are inspired by and connected to the land and can often have a story. So when you see a dancer dance, um, they're often telling a story. Um, dancing is a form of body release as much of our lived and genetic traumas are in our body. So movement and bodily expression, it, it offers the opportunity for those pieces to be released, the trauma to be released from our body. Um, I, uh, one of my favorite things to do, um, when I'm like, just I need to just get away from work or, or um, I need to refocus, regroup myself again. Um, <laughs> reground myself again. Um, I dance. And what's really interesting um, is when I dance, my body naturally moves um like a uh, like when i'm just free dancing i'm just like closing my eyes and dancing my body naturally moves like a fancy shawl dancer which is i'm um it, it is it's a type of dance that uh um, some powwow dance dancers dance and it's a certain style and it's i find it really interesting and amazing that my body moves i just like my my memory um of it so maybe i had an ancestor that was a fancy shawl dancer um, I think that's what it's called. I can't remember. I'm blanking right now. Um, but it was, it, it's, it's really cool. So our bodies hold in our trauma. So what are ways that we can express it? Dancing, singing, releasing like those pieces from us. Like if we need to move, like you can almost feel it. If you just like listen to your body, when you think about something that is bothering you, where is it activated in your body? And how can you potentially address it, move it around um, to get it out? So is it in your throat? Is it in your stomach? Is it in your legs? How can you move your body and have children think about, you know, be, being aware of what is happening in their body during certain things, listening to it? Um, and they're, they're very in tune with that stuff. Um, okay. <clears throat> Another amazing thing that I love to do as well, um, not just with myself, but uh, when I was a teacher, we did a lot of breathing practices. So heightening one's awareness of one's breathing cycle is a freeing practice and a primary principle of a decolonizing embodied pedagogy. So the reason why it is like a decolonizing piece is since breathing, breathing, uh, sorry, maybe do I have it here? Anyways, the reason why it is a decolonization process um, is because it slows us down a bit. Think about a colonial capitalistic society. It's go, 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 produce quick. Now let's go here, rush, time, go. Our body is in like consistent cortisol, heightened, stressed out for no reason. Sometimes there's a reason, but unnecessary things are rushing us all the time. And students can feel this as well, especially, you know, with standardization, 
there like the way that the school system is it is it is focused to perform as opposed to learn for most most things so there there's this pressure all the time so when we offer the space to breathe to just be with our body for a moment so breathing generally happens in a parameter of our consciousness so students can become more greatly empowered by learning more about their own breathing patterns especially in terms of how to release combat breathing through embodied techniques so these are things that you can look up as well embodied learning educators can provide students with various active and passive breathing techniques as tools for calming and energizing so there are many um, types of breathing exercises that you could do um, one of my favorites that I would do with my um, students is the rock, rock breathing. So I would have a basket of rocks. Um, you, it would usually be after recess before math because after recess, children are usually, you know, very energized and can be hyper and not um, particularly ready to learn, especially math sometimes. So they would pick a rock, a rock that, you know, fits there. It just seems right for them. We'd paint our rocks even sometimes. And they would pick one and we would breathe in our frustrations into the rock. So we would breathe it, squeeze it, put in the frustration and then breathe out. And I would tell them, because our grandfather teachings, um, or our grandfathers are rocks because they're the oldest um living things on earth is a rock so i tell my kids it's okay they can handle the pressure and stress that you're under our grandfathers are meant to they are sturdy and they are powerful so hold it into your hand if you squeeze it and you're very frustrated it's okay you can handle it and then just breathe out the stress into it and then sometimes if you want to take it a little further if it's like an emotional day um you can tell the children or encourage the children to like tell the rock something that is bothering them. The rock won't tell anybody else. It's, it's the rock secret. Tell it a secret. It will hold it for you and it can contain it for you. So those are some like just like relaxation pieces that you could do. Um, five finger breathing techniques where you use, you know, five fingers breathing in and out. Um, feathers as well so you can do like the feather teaching where you know you ruffle up the feather you pull it down backwards and that's how we are when we're all like all frazzled and we're you know a little stressed out like I was when my internet disconnected there but the moment that we slow down and breathe and come back to our natural state our calm state we just put the feather back breathing into the feather oh my feather I have feathers on my ears yeah so <laughs> can use that as an example so if you're frazzled you just like pull it back you know and that's the state we are when we're stressed and then when we breathe we become more calm so i encourage you to you know do this with your students but don't forget yourself Remember, you're important too. Your students need you. And I'm going to get to that um, at the end. But don't forget to do these yourself. Self-efficacy is of vital importance in education when you're an educator. All right. So body, mirroring. One second. So mirroring the children's movements can offer them perspective on their own bodily awareness. So allowing the children the opportunity to show you as an educator on how to practice calmness and breathing and provide them a sense of empowerment. So one activity that I would like to, that I do, did with my students, I would come to the front and I would show them like how stressed I am. Like, and this is my body. I'm like really tense. I'm like students. Okay. Kids or friends, please tell me how I should calm myself. So they're able to understand that, oh my, like that's how I look or when I feel this, I do this. So they're able to teach you or teach me when they're guiding you on how to calm you. They're like, okay, plant your feet on the ground. 
breathe, relax your shoulders, relax your jaw. So offering students a an opportunity to showcase their techniques, it gives them a sense of empowerment and agency as well. So mirroring, um, you can, you know, take this with you and um, see how you can mirror in, in your classroom and offer those opportunities as well. Excuse me. So somatic movements. Um, this is a lot of like embodied learning and just embodiment as, as a whole. So describes any practices that you as mind body. Oops. Ah. Hold on. There we go. That uses one second. The mind body connection to help you survey your internal self and listen to signals of your body sends out signals to the uh, areas of pain, discomfort, or imbalance. So bodily awareness for children can provide them an empowerment and advocating for themselves and can understand what they feel and why. So they can listen to their stomach when it's upset. Oftentimes I found that when my students would tell me, oh, my stomach hurts. It's usually an indication that they're stressed or something's occurring. So I would just be, you know, more aware of, of that piece and then offer them tools to, you know, relax their stomach or see if I can talk to them privately if something is bothering them because usually is. So their body is telling them something. So having mind and body uh, connection is very important. So some activities um, to do with your students, uh, acting your feelings, um, interpretive dance party, progressive muscle relaxation, um, yoga and stretching. Um, those are all very helpful as well. Um, I was gonna do this activity, um, but I think um, there's a lot that I wanna cover, but I want to uh, just briefly give you an opportunity to think about this. So body sovereignty. So body sovereignty, um, in the same way, you know, indigenous sovereignty over our lands is inseparable from sovereignty over our bodies and self-expression. So bodily sovereignty is our ability to consent to particular actions that are being, you know, done to us or with us or around us. Like we, we need to discuss, it is important to discuss, you know, consent and what body sovereignty is. Children are often the, like objectified because we're, we're, they're told, you know, what to do and how to do it with their bodies or there's a lot of pressure on them. So how can we provide them with agency over their own body and consent? So um, I, I, I often taught in the beginning of my school year consent, what consent looks like feels like and sounds like and it, it could be anything minuscule you know like just like budding in line or um somebody sitting at your desk and they're touching your things that's not consensual so how can those conversations be guided in your classroom on um, body sovereignty and or consent um, and self-expression so i encourage you to have those uh conversational pieces with your your kids as well <clears throat> the mind. All right. <clears throat> um, so the mind, storytelling. The oral trans, uh, so storytelling for us is, uh, on, as Indigenous peoples is very um, important for many reasons. So the oral transmission of stories and knowledge from past generations to current generations allow us to reflect, reflect critically on the political and cultural environment that brought our personal stories into existence. So stories uh, telling is always relational. So there's always a message um, in storytelling. Um, and I encourage you, you know, if, if you know any story keepers um, that, that would be willing to share, um, you know, a, a, in your classroom, um, just ensure like the proper protocols are in place. Um, if you want to learn more about protocols, um, I, I would go into that, but 
perhaps you can reach out to Alicia Carmen or there's um, protocol pieces that can be that are Googleable um, on how to invite, you know, a story keeper or a knowledge keeper into your classroom. So it offers, you know, perspective and it has a moral of a story in every story that Indigenous peoples tell. So storytelling engages both the teller and the listener in specific performative function, which promotes active and co-created learning rather than passive reception. So if you've ever had the privilege or honor of listening to stories being told by an Indigenous story keeper, um, they're quite interactive, lots of um, um, sound effects. Don't know if you uh, ever listen to native people tell stories, but we always have sound effects when we're telling stories. And I really think that's because, you know, uh, that's how we would tell stories. It just, it, and being storytellers, so we're, we're good storytellers. All right, so the mind rest. Conscious relaxation is believed to help process information and learning and to facilitate deep integration of knowledge. So again, like I said before, in our society, we often move from activity to activity quickly. Oh, we gotta go. We only have this much time for English. We only have this much time for math. We have to rush. We have to get this done. We have to perform. We have to meet the standards. We have to meet these competencies. Let's go. So, um, and through this disorientation re reinforced via societal norms and educational approaches, we become socially conditioned to do, to do, 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 do this, do that, do it quickly, do it now, do it like this. We forget to just be. We forget that part. So through various embodied techniques, educators can help students recover from the withdrawing and the alienating effects of colonial oppression of the go and the perform performance and the do. So what are ways you can facilitate rest for yourself? Don't forget yourself in these pieces. We can offer it to our students, but unless we're rested and taken care of as well, it will often be counterproductive or really frustrating um, to offer it to our students um, effectively. So factors affecting Indigenous students and their learning. So these are often um, said to be the four components that affect the learning of Indigenous students. Classroom features. So what does a classroom look like? Um, are there high expectations? Is there differentiation? Classroom management, is it focused on community and building relationships as opposed to dictatorship? How are you speaking to students? Is there yelling that's occurring? If there is, then how can that be addressed? How can yelling be non-existent? And I really understand what it could be like when you're trying to teach a lesson it is, and your students are acting up, there's like nothing I like happening, um, like no engagement. Um, so a lot of classroom management practices, you know, the yelling or like the often the harsh punishment occurs because what wasn't done earlier. So how can transitions from one lesson to another really you know honor children's autonomy off and offer them respect so for example if we know we're transitioning if students you know let them know like we have this amount of time or i would like your attention and count down to like from 10 or something um just to give them that time as opposed to like okay everyone listen up like be quiet like imagine being in conversation or you're engaged in something and then somebody just tells you to be quiet like that still happened to me in university and I hated it. I'm like, I don't want to do that to my kids. Um, so offer them, you know, respect as a learner and as a student, as a person, when and where possible. Transitions are a huge piece, um, pieces where, where that could be considered. Teacher communities. So professional development is ongoing where data is a critical feature. So ensuring, you know, PD 
is substantiated and not just like the new thing for the sake of being the new thing. Um, and make sure, you know, the environment amongst teachers is good. Um, don't like lateral violence occurring because that affects the teacher. Teachers need to be prioritized as well. School safety for all is a priority. Um, so sorry, schools and climate. Um, so have like a shared leadership is the reality between admin and staff. So is, is there, is there shared leadership? Do teachers also get a say um, in how and where is the priorities or the, the uh, what's it called, the, the year-long plan, the school year plan? I'm blanking today. But how are teachers like involved in that process as well in those priorities? Deconstructing the hidden curriculum, like looking at what is being taught and why and whose voices are being heard or what are what voices are not being heard when you're looking at the curriculum and what's important in your school district um what voices are missing are indigenous pe uh, voices missing if they are how can you address them and the external environment so parents in the community going back to lifelong learning all of those components that surround the child surround the learner are very important and, ins and ensure that those pieces are healthy as well. Healthy community, healthy school, healthy teacher, healthy parents, healthy, healthy community. Um, all of those affect the student. So these are like, you know, some considerations in, in this piece and it comes from uh, what matters in indigenous education. Um, so you can go there if you want to learn, learn some more. Um, yeah. Oh, great. I'm looking at the, the chats right now. Good stuff. So I see some already some relaxation stuff. That's, that is decolonization. Um, so I'm guided. Okay. Um, I was going to do this with you. <laughs> you can do this afterward if you want. Um, but essentially guided, uh, progressive muscle relaxation is you know, going from your feet to the top of your head, um, consciously relaxing each of those muscles. And my students would really like that. I could tell their bodies like are dropping by the time I get to the shoulders and then their face. Um, so guiding them through like the bottom of their feet all the way to the top of their head. It's really helpful, even for myself when I'm, you know, guiding those pieces for them. Um, Okay, so on to one of our last pieces, um, emotions. Oh, emotions. Okay. So a lot of, um, you know, decolonization process is with the understanding that many of Indigenous peoples, um, all, come with intergenerational trauma. And like I said earlier, a lot of that lives in our blood memory uh, through eugenics. Um, and uh, so there, are, so in considering that trauma informed and uh, trauma sensitive approaches would be quite vital um, when considering the environment of your school and then the environment of your classroom. So these are four components that are considered. Um, trauma awareness, so learning about trauma, choice, collaboration, and connection, safety and trustworthiness, and strength base and skill building. Um, so I'm going to elaborate on those pieces in a second. So with considering this, these are some questions to like ask yourself in your practice. Um, and again, this presentation will be uh, sent to you. Um, so these are pieces that you can look at. This also comes from the Center of Excellence for Women's Health. Although it comes from women's health, this is very uh, still very applicable to the education setting as well. So um, for trauma awareness, so do all teachers and and staff in your school have a basic understanding of what causes trauma and its possible effects. So consider that. 
what kind of information about trauma is available to the people that you work with? Um, is it accessible? Do they have that information? Are there staff or programs within your service area that may be able to provide uh, trauma specific services if a parent or caretaker asks for additional support? So is, is there additional resources available to them? And are there community elders and knowledge keepers that can speak to resilience and healing? And not only that, like, don't just like, you know, have them come in to, to talk about trauma and stuff. Our, our elders can, you know, could potentially be quite tired, um, but have them like involved in the school process as well. Are there pieces where, and places where they can have a say and ha offer their insight on policies or frameworks? And not just for the sake of trauma, um, have them, you know, go into classrooms. How, how can they help guide the classroom management or the, the teachers in, in said school or classroom? Um, it is, it would be a wonderful relationship to have too, like to have um, elders know the students and come often. I think that would be healing for both the elders and the, and the students. Um, if, if you should find someone that's willing to do that, I think it'd be beautiful. Uh, safety and trustworthiness, very important. Uh, so what is the first point of contact at your school for the people you work with? So phone messages, outreach workers, receptionists, what strategies for creating a welcoming and safe environment already exist? So again, um, with especially intergenerational trauma, there's a lot of mistrust and rightfully so with the education system for indigenous parents. So how are they welcome? How is it, this is how, how and why is your school or your classroom safe for them? Think about those questions. Uh, take a walk through your waiting areas or your reception areas or just your classroom. Um, at your school, do they increase feelings of safety for the students and the staff? And, you know, parents and community members that may be visiting um, that are Indigenous uh, as well. What steps have you taken that reflect a holistic and engaged process to support cultural safety? So think about the holistic pieces. Offering choice, collaboration, and connection. One second. <clears throat> when working with students, do you encourage open communication, provide choices in care and support whenever possible? Choices are great, um, especially those, you know, a lot of traumatic environments, it's everything is told and said and done to them um, as opposed to for them and offering them agency and autonomy and empowerment is very powerful for those uh, that come from trauma. How do you support inclusion? Um, what are some of your strengths in working with students and how do you use them to build relationships with them? Of anything that you do, anything, um, the relationship with your students is the utmost importance, in my opinion, and their ability to trust you um, and gaining that rapport with them um, is vital, um, especially when, um, you know, you're, you're working with a student that does come from trauma <clears throat> or ongoing um, yeah, issues. Um, how are mistakes and uncertainties handled in your classroom? Um, oops. Sorry, my mouse is being weird. Um, are they viewed as opportunities for learning? So as well, I think what is really important, especially when you're gaining trust um, or developing trust with your students is apologizing when you mess up too. As teachers, we can become impatient. We become frazzled. Or we make a mistake sometimes when we're doing a math equation or social studies and say, you know what, Mis uh, mistakes are made. Or if it is something that you were, you were disrespecting the students, um, you went off the handle a bit or you weren't regulating in that moment, have an opportunity to, to sit down with that student or with your students and apologize. Um, do like some self-care for yourself first, of course. And then it just shows them, you know, 
adults can make mistakes too. And we could still work to rectify those mistakes. The adults were not always, we are not perfect. I, I have a theory that we're all just kids pretending to be adults. I, I don't feel very adult like most of the time. Like to pretend like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I think I know what I'm doing. Um, but we are all a work in progress and just showing them vulnerability and that our ability to apologize and um, just really builds trust with them as well. And as well as other, you know, how are, how are they view, are mistakes viewed as opportunities for learning? Um, another buzzword too, and I'm sure a lot of you have uh, done this um, growth mindset type of language and activities um, and awareness for students. So I'd encourage you to look at that if you haven't yet, or just, you know, re look at those pieces. How can you cultivate growth learning mindset in your classroom? Um, Strength-based and skill-based learning. So are there opportunities within your classroom? Um, delivery to focus on skill building. So self-regulation, awareness of triggers and coping skills. Are those opportunities nourished in your classroom and discussed? Can you center, uh, shift away from an emphasis on service user deficits to strengths? So do you ask about uh, your students' interests, um, coping skills and survival strategies? So they can often tell you what, what they, they offer them some agency too. Like they, they know their strengths and just help them find it. For the most part, they know it. Um, but it'd be great to guide that as well. Um, how is education and support related to vicarious or secondary trauma provided within your organization or, or your school? Um, so these are all questions that, you know, just consider them, um, reflect on them. Um, again, they'll be offered in the presentation later, sent to you later. Okay, um, all right. <clears throat> so ideas for facilitating emotionally safe spaces in the classroom. Some of these ideas I, um, I did myself, well, all of them I did myself. Um, and I'd be curious to hear what yours are as well. Maybe others can learn uh, from you. Um, so ideas for facilitating emotional safe classrooms. So mindfulness practices. Um, there is this wonderful curriculum um, called Mind Up Curriculum. I use it uh, in my first year of teaching, and I used many of its components throughout my education career and for myself. So what is really cool about the Mind Up Curriculum and what it offers, it, um, it provides language and knowledge to the students about the areas in their brain that facilitate learning and facilitate calmness. So they talk about the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. So my students were able to identify what they are and what their purpose is. And like I said earlier, once you have the vocabulary of emotions or even other things, it can offer you the opportunity to self-regulate. So my students would, um, um, the, the curriculum itself does go have uh, lessons for, for teachers. And it's according to grades as well. There's primary, um, primary grades, junior, and then middle school. So it's, it's wonderful. Um, so it has like emotional, uh, emotion language um, in there and how they're able to understand why it's important to calm their amygdala, but not to dishonor that piece of themselves because the amygdala is meant to protect them. It gets activated when we're stressed, sometimes a perceived threat. So we would talk about that. So my students had that knowledge about their brain and it just offered them, you know, insight as to, okay, my amygdala is activated right now. How can I calm it down? so that my prefrontal cortex could be activated so that I can learn. So our learning happens here. Um, but if our amygdala is activated, knowledge could be blocked. So um, we, we talked about that when we could. I mean, there's a lot of things to, to go through and stuff, but I, this was such an important piece for, for me as a teacher and for my students to learn about 
um, because it offered, you know, language and an understanding to how their body works and identifying it. It's very um, empowering. The classroom setup. How is the classroom set up? Is how's the lighting? Is the <laughs> I was known for the, the many lamps in uh, my classroom and the twinkly lights. I hated the harsh lighting above. How much natural light can you cultivate in your classroom as much as possible? Um, what's the seating like? Is there a calming area available to students where they can go when they're feeling stressed out? What kind of tools and stuff could be offered in that area, like a relaxation bottle? Is there scents or medicines that could be there? Um, stuff like that. Is there music playing in the classroom? Um, what kind of music? Is there private opportunities for students to just have some privacy, like boxes that could potentially, like you know, like act as a cubicle? Because sometimes you just need time to yourself. And I honor those times where my students are just need some time. Um, classroom routines. Um, to include emotional calming activities. How often do they happen? I would say at minimum have two to three calming activities a day, one for the beginning, one in the middle, and perhaps one to end the day. Um, they would you know, just really help to calm their amygdala and then have, you know, creating a safe place for your students. I'm curious what other, um, cause I know, cause if you're listening to this um, workshop right now, I'm sure many of you have your own ideas. Um, what type of uh, ways do you facilitate emotional safety in your classroom? So I'd be curious to hear it. I can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Some of the banks of the lighting, yeah. My granddaughter asked me last night, how does my brain know what it knows and respond so fast to what people say? Yeah, honestly, I would suggest go to the Mind Up curriculum. There's like very like developmentally appropriate language and ways of talking about these things. So you can talk about, you know, the, the amygdala, like how does it know that it needs like safety right now? The amygdala, it offers you protection. It channels your body to give the, the chemicals to respond. But then sometimes with anxiety, it creates scenarios that aren't, that may not even be real or you're overthinking. And then just recognizing that, recognizing that and not judging yourself too harshly on it as well. Uh, is there anybody that wants to share uh, any like emotionally safety practices that they do? The daily five? Oh spiritual oh honor student voice regarding their space spiritual moments in the morning breathing meditation oh images and music love that take five where students choose how to reset their brain right on we use the calm app oh i love the calm app it has like saved me many times i have like anxiety issues and uh the calm app helps me too and i'm like really forthcoming with my students as well, like being vulnerable to them about like, uh, you get stressed out too. We're human, we're, we're, we're trying our best. And uh, just being open to, with them, you know, being vulnerable. We're not always superheroes. It's part of decolonizing too. Okay, wonderful. If you wanna to continue to share, please share because others can learn as well. Yes, going outside as much as possible for real. Okay, so um, just a closing activity, I guess. Commitments to decolonization and resurgence. So when I do workshops, I think about it as an active, an active exchange. So I'm offering you some pieces that I know, but how are you as an educator, as a person in the society and in Canada, how are you going to commit now? to decolonizing and supporting indigenous resurgence for yourself, for your classroom, school, and then beyond. What are you gonna do now? I offered you these things. So I would like to do an active exchange with you. 
um, we'll do this for maybe about five minutes. So um, we'll fill out this table and then that way it could also be part of the uh, presentation. Um, so with what you know, or even with what uh, you learned before in possibly other spaces, what kind of commitments are you willing to do for yourself um, as a teacher, as an administrator, or as a person um, supporting education? Um, what can you do? So I put self-efficacy. I think I meant to just put self or self-efficacy. Yeah, let's talk about that later. Um, so what can you do for yourself to ensure, maybe that's why I had self-efficacy. I probably should have kept it. One second, I'll keep it. So self-efficacy, we gotta make sure that you're okay too. I know it's really hard being a teacher. We give, give, give. I've never been more exhausted in my life being an educator, a classroom educator um, or um, an ECE. It is exhausting because we are giving and we're giving um, our time, our energy, but we have to remember to recenter and refocus on ourselves as well. So what commitments are you gonna have for yourself here on in, or even that you already have? So please share them in the chat or you can raise your hand. What commitments will you have for your own self-efficacy as an educator? Oh wait. I'll give you some time to put a comment or say something. Hmm. Smudging, yeah. That honestly makes a heck of a difference for me. Sleep, oh my goodness, sleep. Yes, sleep is very important. Make sure you're getting enough sleep. Listen to your body, it will tell you what's enough for you. Meditation. Time. Timing is reasonable. Yeah. Great. I don't know. I was going to just say that I don't know about the PD on our school staff. I don't know. I'm hearing from you. I'm screening the body, dancing. Nice. Fitness walks to relax and de stress. Oops. Time in nature. Fitness walks. Oh. Yes, time in nature. Put in your feet on the ground. Take your shoes off. Take your socks off. The earth literally regulates your body. Do that for like three minutes a day. It's a huge difference. Learn more about your community. Yeah. Oops. Therapy. Yep. I'm a huge person for therapy. I go to therapy every other week or every week, depending on depending on what I'm feeling. Learn about the community. Students are coming. Yes. Wonderful. Question. We are not following our right answer to the question of the slides. We are deaf. We are we can share in the chat and response so we can access. Uh, Okay. Um, all right. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so classroom and school. So what are your commitments based on what I shared today? Um, or even before then, what are your commitments to decolonization and indigenous resurgence? I'll give you a moment to put on the chat. I'll give you some time to answer the third, second column, sorry. Don't be shy to raise your hand and talk if you want. Including circle talks. Great. Those are uh, wonderful to have. 
definitely offer a sense of community. <clears throat> Any other commitments that you want to share? Miigwech, <laughs> Mary, for coming. Ensuring that Indigenous ways are not just highlighted on special days. Yes. Yes. Oh, beyond June or September 30th. Cooking classes, teaching food, stories, and sovereignty. Love that. When you do that, don't forget to talk about food security, especially for uh, nations like my own, where food is ridiculously expensive. Great. Um, inclusion of elders, parents, lead community. Yes. Great. Ensure that you know the education levels of all students. Commit to all students. So we'll leave your classroom and learning more. Great. All right. So beyond the classroom now, you as a citizen, if you're Canadian, you're a settler um, and you're non-Indigenous, how will you support decolonization um, in society? Um, and if you are Indigenous, how also as well, how, how will you ensure you know, our people are um, encouraged and supported in our reclamation. Vote for people who commit to decolonization, exactly. There is voting uh, this week, isn't there? Isn't it? Vote, commit to truth and history, yep. <clears throat> yes, who you vote for matters. Creating opportunities for other educators through learning sessions such as these and the challenge and reflect further. Yes. Challenging and reflective. I like that. Understand my own privilege and continue to decolonize myself. Great. Okay. Share learning, use social media for good. Yep. Yeah, and follow me if you want. <laughs> Relentless Indigenous Woman on Facebook. Um, I do post a lot of stuff that are it's quite challenging. Um, could offer challenging perspectives, but um, I think that's what gives it a, a, a level of oomph. Interrupt colonial processes and structures, yes. Those make for very interesting uh, family dinners. Strategic plans and control of school work at all levels. And Great, wonderful. Well, I will take all of that for now. Um, I'll place it here and uh, can use some of these pieces when it's being sent out. Uh, okay, policy change. So I'll put that one in and we'll move on. Okay, great. Oops. Okay. Um, all right, so here are some resources that I would highly recommend. Um, Treaty Education Alliance, um, they have a comprehensive collection of lessons designed for Indigenous communities across Canada. Wonderful resource, the link is there uh, when I send it to you. Um, Learning First People. So this was created by the First Nations Steering Committee in BC. So it is a series of teacher resources to support English. Uh, so like, like when language arts, science, social studies, and math. Learning the land, uh, resources and lessons to guide learning from the land and understanding our connection to it. Great stuff there. And the Mind Up curriculum, which I was talking about earlier learning the brain. So it provides a vehicle for whole child, whole school, whole community transformation, offering programs based on neuroscience. So although like these are like really important pieces, it's not necessarily in, indigenized, but um, there may be ways for you to do so. It just offers, you know, students and yourselves tools to just be more um, cognitively aware. Um, all right. So this is my remember to take care of, of you. Um, being an edu educator is one of the hardest jobs. 
and from the tragedy of yesterday um, in the United States, um, it, it just really shows, you know, how policies that just totally, uh, I could I could go on for that one, on that one, but how prioritizing students in a safe manner without the act of violence or creating spaces where violence could be potential, being proactive and offering, you know, these decolonial ways that nurture the whole student, but please remember to nurture your whole self as well. Um, I know some days I would be crying by the end of the day because I'm just so exhausted. There's so many needs. We are so many things to so many little learners were counselors, were nurses sometimes. I remember like holding my hand out and student like puked in my hand and like all over my shoes. We're, we're, we're educators and we were so many things to these little learners. But please don't forget to, to take care of yourself. That is also part of decolonization, prioritizing yourself and, and teachers in your school um, where performance, we really need to question and challenge that. Is performance, what, what, who does that serve? It serves capitalism. It's not sustainable. We're performing and doing and extracting. Really challenge those narratives. Remember to be, be human, be a child, have fun. Don't become disenchanted by the realities of this world. Remember your wonder. Remember the fun. Remember that. Remember why you became a teacher or in your position in the first place. Um, have compassion for yourself when things are hard and you didn't do well on a certain day or in a certain moment. Remember to love you. Be compassionate. It is tough. But if you're really tough on yourself, it makes it all the more hard. So please love yourself. It's okay. You're going to be okay. You're building roads of healing when you're decolonizing. You're creating tools of empowerment for these children that will be adults. You are helping build the road of the seven generation prophecy that was foretold where indigenous peoples will rise up again and help maneuver the world out of the destruction that it's causing right now. You are important. Remember that. I hope that you take that with you. Um, I am honored to have been here with you today. What you do matters. It really does. Um, you have imprinted on children. They'll remember you forever. Don't forget that. Um, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to speak with you. Um, you can find me on Facebook, uh, Relentless Indigenous Woman, um, on Instagram and TikTok if you want to find me there as well. If you want to send me an email, please uh, do. It's info at relentlessindigenouswoman.ca. I have a website as well. If you do want to, you know, gain some of my insight or um, even want to book me for something, I'd be more than happy um, when I can. So thank you, miigwech so much. Take care of yourselves and all love. Thank you.